Hi everyone, and thanks for joining our webinar on NSF's ANSI 61, Drinking Water System Components Health Effects, and NSF ANSI 419, Public Drinking Water Equipment Performance Filtration. Just so you know, this webinar is being recorded and you are placed on mute when you logged in. If you have any questions at any point, please feel free to use the chat function and we'll answer your questions at the very end. So we have two speakers today who will be discussing these two standards. Uh, the first is Katie Foster. She is our Technical Operations Manager for Municipal Water Products. And then our second speaker today is Mike Blumenstein, who is a Senior Technical Reviewer in our Filtration Program. So thanks again, everybody, for joining. And with that, I will turn it over to Katie. Good morning. Um, Katie Foster, and like Kate just said, I'm the Technical Operations Manager for Standard 61 Water Distribution Systems. Um, I've been reviewing products in this area for almost eight years now, so hopefully I have a good amount of knowledge to pass on to you all. Um, basic items on our agenda this morning, I'm just going to give a brief intro about NSF International as a company, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the basic requirements of Standard 61, especially as it applies to municipal filters. And then Mike Blumenstein is going to discuss more details about Standard 419. So NSF International is a global independent public health and safety organization. Um, and our mission and focus is centered around protecting, improve, protecting and improving human health. Um, we carry out this health and safety mission by writing standards for food, drinking water, air quality, dietary supplements, consumer products, and environmental safety. Um, by testing and certifying products to these standards, auditing products and product manufacturers for compliance to these standards, as well as providing consulting and training services. Uh, NSF International really got its start in the beginning part of the 1900s. So Americans began dining out late, dining out more in the late 1930s, and regulations started to begin to be made for these different um, food service establishments. But the problem was there was a wide variety of criteria being used for products used in these um, food service establishments. Um, so that led to problems with inconsistent rules and regulations that varied from town to town and state to state. Um, so a need was recognized to create some uniform national standards. And this is really where NSF got its start. So NSF brings together industry regulators and consumers to create standards that um, work in the interest of public health and safety. So in 1944, NSF was officially founded as the National Sanitation Foundation at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Uh, today we are known as NSF International. Our corporate headquarters are in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is where we're broadcasting to you today. Um, but we have 51 office and lab locations worldwide. <clears throat> so today we are a leader in public health and safety. We are a developer of over 90 national consensus standards and we have close ties with international, federal, state and local regulators. And we are a service provider to organizations in 168 countries and NSF has office and laboratory locations in 51 locations worldwide. Um, and we are accredited by a wide number of organizations for our certification programs. Uh, the two that apply to the United States and Canada are ANSI and SCC. So just a little on NSF Global Water Programs. Um, our water programs develop standards, test, and certify products that come into contact with drinking water, such as plumbing components, plastic piping, water treatment chemicals, drinking water treatment units, as well as pool and spa equipment. Um, many of these standards have been adopted by US EPA to protect drinking water or to promote pool and spa safety. So we test and certify to standards related to plumbing products, um, filtration and municipal water produ products, um, which we'll discuss further today. Um, and we also have standards relating to wastewater treatment, recreational water safety, and sustainability. So 
At this point, I'm going to dig in a little deeper to NSF ANSI 61, especially as it relates to municipal filters. So the scope of NSF 61 is that NSF 61 establishes minimum health effects requirements for chemical contaminants and impurities that are directly imparted to drinking water from products, components, and materials used in drinking water systems. The scope of the standard does not include performance, taste and odor, microbial growth support requirements, or point of use water drinking treatment devices. Um, those point of use drinking water treatment devices are covered under their own standards. Um, so basically the scope of the standard covers all products that, have a, that could have contact with drinking water anywhere from the source to the tap, including water treatment devices and filters used for municipal use, which is what we're going to discuss today. Um, the standard was first adopted in 1988 um, following development by NSF, AWWA, the AWWA Research Foundation, US EPA, ASDWA, and Health Canada. Um, the standard is revised annually by a balanced joint committee that is comprised of U.S. and Canadian regulators, water utility representatives, um, other users, as well as product manufacturers. So what are the requirements for Standard 61? Basically, Standard 61 is just interested in determining which contaminants migrate or extract into drinking water from products um, that contact the potable water. And then of those contaminants that migrate or extract into water, are they below the maximum allowable level as uh, designated by the standard? So really each step of certification is centered around answering this question. So when a product comes through for certification, the first thing that we do is require that the product manufacturer disclose the exact materials and suppliers used for each wetted component of their product. Those material formulations are reviewed and used to determine the appropriate analytical testing to perform. So typically this includes metals testing and organics testing, including VOC scans, scans for halogenated compounds, polynuclear aromatic compounds, phthalates, phenolics, and many others. It's really done on a material specific basis um, where the formulation for the product is examined and a custom test battery is assigned to the product based on um, the product's chemical composition. So after the information is received, NSF issues a sample request to the product manufacturer and indicates what sample should be sent in for testing. The sample is then sent in, and in the case of municipal filters, the product gets flushed according to the manufacturer's normal use instructions. Um, the product gets exposed to specially formulated water for a number of days as specified by the standard. So in the case of municipal filters, the product is conditioned with water for 14 days, which is basically a series of um, water changes. So the product is put under pressure, filled with water, and that water is discarded basically every day for 14 days. Then following that 14 day period there are three exposure days where the water again is exposed to exposure water under pressure and on each of those days the water is discarded. The last day of that period the water is collected and sent for analysis. So this is just showing the, an extraction step. The contaminants are extracted out of that exposure water and put on uh, the different analytical instruments to analyze for the contaminants as specified by the test battery. Uh, following the analytical testing, those test results are um, sent to our toxicology team who performs a toxicological evaluation in which the results from the test report are compared to the acceptable limits as defined by the standard. The test reports are then assigned a passing or failing status and issued to the client. In parallel with the product testing is a audit or a manufacturing facility inspection. So NSF auditors 
visit the manufacturing facility and perform an inspection, which typically includes a full walkthrough of the production area, a review of the production processes and quality control program, identification of possible sources of contamination, as well as verification of materials and sources used in the product. So the auditor is really looking in that case to confirm that the product being manufactured is being manufactured in the same way that was disclosed to NSF during the information gathering phase. So is the product we tested representative of the actual product being produced? So once all requirements are met, once the uh, product has successfully passed qualification testing and the audit has been successfully completed, products are then certified by NSF and entitled to bear the NSF mark. Certified products are then put into NSF public listings. Um, and for these municipal filters, the listings typically include restrictions on the use of the product in the field. So, for example, municipal filters are typically listed with a minimum daily permeate flow rate, and this is because those numbers were used to evaluate the actual product as tested. Um, and as I mentioned, NSF listings are made publicly available on the Internet through NSF's webpage. And then products certified to NSF 61 at NSF International are actually retested annually as well as audited annually. And that just ensures that the product continues to comply to the standard. So NSF ANSI 61 is widely recognized in the United States. Um, NSF International worked with the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators, or ASWA, ASDWA to conduct a survey of U.S. states to identify those states that currently have either legislation, regulations, or policies in place for NSF ANSI 61. Um, and currently, 48 out of 50 states uh, require NSF 61. So this is a um, widely required standard, and a lot of these municipal filtration products are required to have 61 to be um, used in most states. Okay, so now I'm going to hand the conversation over to my colleague, Mike Blumenstein, to talk about 419. Thank you. Good morning. So, for, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 419 is a fairly new standard. You can see by its high number. And it covers the performance testing of these uh, municipal filters that we can also certify under 61. So this, uh, the idea for this standard started uh, quite a while ago with the United States Environmental Protection Agency's ETV program. This program uh, by the EPA operated from 1995 to 2014, and NSF was the drinking water system center for this program. So as such, uh, we developed and conducted or oversaw um, tests in the field for new and innovative treatment technologies. And one of those new and innovative treatment technologies, um, at least approximately 15 to 20 years ago, was UF um, filtration modules. So there was a protocol developed uh, by a group of stakeholders um, for the physical removal of microbiological and particulate contaminants. And that was a protocol that um, covered one-time site-specific field testing. So there would be an ETV report that would be generated that would say, we tested this filtration module at site X, and these are the results. Um, and those reports were used to help assist um, other states and other agencies to um, approve these uh, new and innovative treatment technologies. 
Then in um, 2006, the LT2 rule came along for enhanced surface water treatment. And one of the requirements was testing of um, any filtration device that is being used for cryptosporidium removal credits. So the ETV protocol was revised in 2010 to comply with the LT2 requirements. Um, and then when the ETV program ended, NSF decided to convert this ETV protocol into an NSF ANSI standard so that we could continue to offer this service of testing these modules. So NSF ANSI 419 was published in 2015. The standard applies not only to microfiltration and ultrafiltration modules, but also bag and cartridge filters, uh, which are also included under the LT2 rule. And the whole purpose of this uh, standard and this certification is to uh, give a, a listing or a certification for removal of cryptosporidium oocysts. And as we already discussed, the reason for all this is because in the LT2 rule to get surface water treatment credits uh, for a filtration device, um, there's a requirement for product-specific challenge testing. The product-specific challenge testing is a little different than some of the other EPA rules that are technology-specific, such as you know, chlorine addition or sand filtration, where as long as you're using that technology, you get certain credits. Uh, for the LT2 rule, they required um, the actual product, every product to be tested and have its own test data. And one of the other, some of the other requirements that are uh, highlights of that LT2 rule are that you use either cryptosporidium oocysts themselves or a conservative surrogate. You have to test at the maximum design flux and maximum recovery. And the maximum feed concentration is six and a half logs. Uh, that was set that it was set that way to avoid overseeding and artificially high uh, log reduction credits or log reduction claims, I guess I would say, by the manufacturer. And one of the most important pieces and one of the um, kind of the most trickiest, which um, we'll touch on a little bit more later is that the manufacturer must run a non-destructive manufacturing QC test that can be directly correlated to the measured cryptosporidium removal through the performance testing. And this is known as the quality control release value. That's weird. How did that happen? Huh. Can anybody see that? <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Well, I will um, try to read that one as best as I can here. Um, what's that first word? Challenge testing. So in, NS in NSF ANSI 419, uh, the challenge testing protocol that is published in that standard complies with the LT2 rule and the, also the US EPA's Membrane Filtration Guidance Manual requirements. I guess the guidance manual is not really requirements, it's just um, guidance for how you should be running these tests, um, but we have adopted those as essentially as requirements in Standard 419. Instead of using cryptosporidium oocysts for the challenge test, uh, at least for now, we are using um, endospores of the bacterium Bacillus atrophaeus, and those are considered to be a conservative surrogate for cryptosporidium oocysts because they are smaller, as you can see by the dimensions there um, underneath. Um, there is a proposal for the next joint committee meeting covering the standard to allow cryptosporidium oocysts to be used as an actual challenge organism, which I assume will be adopted. Um, the, one of the reasons why we um, 
went with o o the um, endospores instead of oocysts is because they're a lot safer to work with, especially at higher, um, higher volumes and higher flow rates in the laboratory. So an NSF ANSI 419, um, some more specifications here. We have a um, requirement that at least five new modules be tested. Um, and I, this, this presentation isn't really covering bag or cartridge filters. For those, you only have to test two because that is written into, um, I believe, the, some, sort of, some of the challenge testing requirements um, in the, uh, it's not in the membrane filtration guidance manual. There's a separate manual. I think it's just called the toolbox um, guidance manual or something like that. Um, but under 419, we have to test five new modules. That number was decided upon by NSF working with the EPA um, back when this was just an ETV protocol, and we've kept that requirement. So the modules are sent to the testing laboratory brand new. They are flushed and conditioned per the manufacturer's instructions, and then we immediately proceed with testing from there. There's no seasoning period or anything like that. Um, the standard specifies that the design of the test apparatus must meet the specifications in the guidance manual. Um, I'm not going to go into those details right here, but I will say, um, you know, there's things such as how far upstream of the modules do you need to inject your contaminant, um, how do you collect the samples, um, you know, flame sterilizing um, the sampling ports, things like that, before you collect samples. Um, those types of things are um, covered in standard 419. And another very important um, specification is that both the test apparatus and the modules um, are sanitized, must be sanitized prior to testing. Most manufacturers use um, bleach as part of their um, conditioning and sanitization procedure anyway. Um, but the whole test apparatus must be sanitized also um, so you don't get any um, contamination of the endospores surviving from your previous test or something like that. The test water um, is just specified as dechlorinated tap water. There are some water chemistry specifications in 419, um, but they're not too exciting, so we'll skip over that right here. Um, it's just basically tap water. Um, I wrote here that the modules will likely be tested individually. There's no specification that says they must be tested individually, but in reality, it's not easy to test multiple modules at once. So at least here at NSF, we test the modules individually. The tests are pretty short. Um, you know, some of the point of use filtration tests can last days or even weeks. But for these tests, um, they are only approximately 35 minutes in length. Um, and the reason why they're 35 minutes is because you're intermittently injecting your, your, your challenge particle into the feed stream. And you need to do that at startup, then after 15 minutes and after 30 minutes. And at 30 minutes, you have to inject it long enough to allow for at least three holdup volumes to pass through the modules before you collect your samples. So that takes um, maybe a minute or two. So usually it ends up being around 35 minutes by the time you get done. And also uh, back up there in the middle, we have to test these at the maximum design flux. And that is specified in the listings that, you know, what the flux was that we used for testing. Some more specifications of 419. The testing laboratory must replicate the manufacturer's non-destructive QTC test, um, also called a non-destructive performance test, or NDPT, in the EPA guidance manual. This is very important because it establishes a new quality control release value for the modules that are going to be awarded the log removal value that was measured during testing. 
So this is, perform this is important because if the manufacturer sends in modules that perform too well, then you can reset your QCRV too low and thus exclude a large percentage of the modules that you manufacture thereafter from being able to be awarded these removal credits. So for instance, if your um, pressure decay rate is 0.1 PSI per minute for your QC test in your manufacturing facility, and that's, the, that's the kind of the pass-fail level where you're going to either approve or reject that module for sale. And the modules you send in for testing have a pressure decay rate of only 0.05 PSI per minute instead of 0.1. Now you've reset the QCRV at 0.05 and thus potentially um, excluding many of the, the modules that you're producing. Um, another specification in 419 is that if you have a different, if you're, if you're or, or I guess if, I should say, if you're recommending a field daily integrity test that is different from your manufacturing QC test, then that test, uh, that field daily integrity test must also be conducted on each module, uh, both before and after each challenge test. And this is important because it allows correlation of the log removal value that you measured during testing to this direct integrity test result. Um, and in the guidance manual, there are some fairly complicated calculations on how you can take a, law, uh, a DIT response, which in most cases is going to be a pressure decay test, and you can calculate that into a theoretical log removal value. So we want to, um, we, we, we didn't used to do this, but we were asked to add it um, to the test battery so that the reports will show that this is the theoretical LRV DIT, and then also this is the actual measured LRV from the performance test, from the, or the microbial challenge test and you can see the differences or the similarities between each of those. So there are many benefits to standard 419 certification. Um, the standard has codified many of the membrane filtration guidance manual recommendations or suggestions as actual requirements. Uh, 419 offers independent third-party testing um, it offers consistency and that the certifying body must be notifi notified of any changes to the product. So if you have a manufacturer that is making changes to their UF fibers or their potting resin or something like that, um, NSF is going to be notified of those changes for both uh, 61 certification and 419 certification. And we would review those changes and t t determine whether any retesting needed to occur. Uh, 419 is, can be kept up to date and a little more current than the LT2 rule or the guidance manual, which are both 10 years old now. Um, 419 could be revised every year if we had to, um, to keep up to date on changes in technologies or changes in analytical methods. Um, and lastly, and pretty importantly, I believe, is that we our, have our auditing requirement, um, which Katie discussed for 61. So when we go into the manufacturing facility for the 61 audit, we can also do a 419 audit. And we can review the manufacturer's QC records to verify that um, the modules that they're marking as 419 certified actually meet that quality control release value that I discussed a little bit ago. So um, again, how do you find NSF certified products? Um, you can look for the NSF marks on the product, or they could just say NSF 61 and NSF 419 without having to use the mark. And then there's also the NSF website where you can search the listings for both 61 and 419 products. 
Um, I believe the 419 listings are under, the, the heading for that is public drinking water equipment um, is the kind of the program name we came up with for that. <coughs> 